Good morning and welcome everyone. Glad to be here again. Appreciated that song art about wonderful love. So this morning we're starting a new series. I guess I can't get away from doing series on different things, but about God and government. And we're going to look about a little bit about how God established government in the Old Testament. And you may find this less inspirational and more of a history lesson, but I hope we can lay a good foundation so that we can, uh, that we can move on. Um, there's going to be lots of scriptures, so, so stay with me and try to, even if you don't turn to them all, at least stay with me on that. And then we want to next look at the Christian and government. What's our role? What, what's, what's our responsibility? And then um, the Christian and government today and how we should be living in relation to the government, involvement in the government. So let's start right in in the beginning, or near the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 9. This is when Noah and his family had just come right out of the ark. And God's giving them some instructions because some things changed since before the flood. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky with everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give all to you as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat, fl eat fl flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood from every beast I will require it. And from every man and from every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. So God's instituting a number of things here as they're coming out of the flood. A few, he reminded them again to populate the earth as he had told Adam and Eve in the beginning. He said that animals would now be for food. They were vegetarian before, as far as we know. Or at least that's what God had said they should be. They were to eat plants, and now they were also to eat animals for food. And God also instituted the death penalty. He said if anyone kills someone else, the penalty for that is death. And I think there is, by extension, the establishment of government. I don't know what your thoughts are. Was there government before the flood? Was there any type of, or, or was this something new? It's it definitely the death penalty seems to be something new that God was establishing. Or was it anarchy? It certainly seems that evil was not restrained before the flood. Genesis 6.11 says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. It seemed like there was no restraint against evil. We'll get there. <laughs> so I don't know that we know for sure. There were cities. Did they have some type of government? Perhaps. But it seems like God was at least taking it to a new level. And God instituted government. Why? Why do you think? Why did God institute government? He, it doesn't say anything about that before, whether or not they had some form of government or not. We don't really know for sure. But why did why do you think God instituted government? Thank you, Titus. He knew what man needed. Punish evildoers. In other words, to restrain evil, to control evil. In the garden, things were perfect. There was a relationship that created order, kept evil out. But there was, since that relationship was broken, the earth filled up with violence. And when people don't have a relationship with God, they need something to control their actions, to control them. And another thing to break the cycle of revenge, if we go back to Genesis 4, Cain had killed his brother. God gave him a mark. And apparently, Cain was also killed later. Genesis 4.23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. 
and I'm reading in the New American Standard uh, Version if you're following along. Um, apparently, Cain had done something to Lamech, and as retaliation, he had been killed. Cain had been, Lamech had killed Cain, and um, there was this, this mark, but that didn't seem to restrain evil very much. And so God, <clears throat> I think one of those reasons um, that he instituted government was to, to restrain that evil and to stop that cycle of revenge. Revenge can continue and continue, and we see more about that in the Old Testament law, how God took further steps to, to prevent revenge. So I'd like to look a little bit at the principles of government that God established in the Old Testament. And I think that <clears throat> the principles that God established in the Old Testament still hold true today for government. And I, I don't have a, a Bible verse to, to really support this, but I think that it seems to be that governments today who operate on the principles that God established in the Old Testament, the civil principles, have some level of blessing even if those governments are not Christian or godly in any way, that these principles are how God has designed government to work. And so there is a blessing on people who, who governments who follow that to follow that today. Another principle is government is ordained by God. And David was very, very clear on this concept. First Samuel 24, 5. It came about afterward that David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the edge of Saul's robe. So uh, I think you probably know this story. David was running away from Saul. Saul was chasing him. And David was hiding in the, in the cave where Saul came into. And it seems that in order to show Saul that he had no ill will and that he could have killed him, he cut off the edge of his robe. And, but even that, bother David's conscience. He said, so he said to his men, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my arm against him since he is the Lord's anointed. David persuaded his men with these words and did not allow them to rise up against Saul. And Saul arose, left the cave and went on his way. David was very, very clear. God ordains this man. This man was an evil man. He was chasing him down for his life. He was not someone that it was even God's will to be in charge of the country, but he was clear God had ordained this person. And I think we can take some lessons from that today, whether or not we approve of the leaders that, we, that are uh, in the government. They are ordained by God. And in the Old Testament, where it was acceptable for God's people to fight, to punish evil, to kill other people in war. David would do nothing against Saul because he was ordained by God. Now, on a side note, he did not, if, if he did not defend his own kingship. Later on, um, Abish, um, Shimei had cursed him, and Abishai, one of his soldiers, the son of Zariah, said, should not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? Here Abishai was saying, this, you, now you are the Lord's anointed and this person should be punished. David then said, what have I to do with you, O sons of Zariah, that you should be this day an adversary to me? Should any man be put to death in Israel today? For I do not... For do I not know that I am king over Israel today? The king said to Shimei, you shall not die. Thus the king swore to him. So he was humble enough to, to realize that, that um, even though he was now the Lord's anointed, he was going to let God take care of that and wasn't going to defend it himself. And I think there's another thing that we should understand, if, if any of you have studied American history, we, uh, the founding fathers of the United States were very clear that uh, they believed that the authority to govern comes from the people who are being governed. And that is just not a biblical principle at all because the Bible is very clear that God ordains authorities and whether or not the people who want to be governed or are being governed want to be, God, is, God has ordained that authority. Another principle of government is that government is fallen with mankind. We're part of a fallen world, and government is far from perfect. Even good kings like David and Solomon definitely made mistakes. And government can never change people's hearts. It can only regulate their actions. And so um, as we look into the New Testament, what that says, what the New Testament says about government, that's something we need to understand. Government can never change people's hearts. 
Government is a thermometer of the condition of society. So if we see a corrupt government, probably it's a corrupt, it's, it's corrupt people. And people follow leaders, and leaders follow people. If you look throughout the history of Israel, when they had a bad king, the people did bad things, generally speaking. When they had a good king, the people did good things. And when Israel wasn't following God and they asked God to give them a king, they got what they deserved. And they got a king who was, at least in the end, proud, not willing to follow God, which was some of the same things they had been exhibiting and asking for a king that was going against what God had said. Another principle of government is that government accomplishes God's purposes. Proverbs 21 says, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. In spite of how bad a king might be, he's going to accomplish what God wants. Isaiah 44, 28, God was speaking. He said, It is I who says of Cyrus, Cyrus was a ruler of the wicked empire of Persia. He is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Nebuchadnezzar was, not, was a cruel, ruthless conqueror, and he accomplished the purpose of God by punishing wicked Judah, even though he was likely even more wicked than they were. So government accomplishes God's purposes, but that doesn't mean that the government or the government leaders are godly or Christian. And it doesn't mean that the government is using God's ways to accomplish those purposes that God has in mind. But in the end, God's purposes will never be defeated and and the government will accomplish God's purposes. Another principle, government is accountable to God. Godly people preserve a nation, evil people destroy it. And that's true whether it's the people or the, or the leaders. If you look at the Canaanites who lived in Canaan before Israel came there, they, had, they were extremely wicked. They had awful practices in their worship, child sacrifice, horrible immorality, all these things. And God held those people accountable for those actions. And look at the, at the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, very wicked cities, God held them accountable and he punished that with them. And when a nation becomes overwhelmingly wicked and receives punishment for whatever those sins are that that they're doing, often the righteous and the innocent people suffer along with that. There were innocent children in Canaan, probably in Sodom. In the case of Sodom, God did deliver Lot, but many times innocent people suffer when a country is punished for its wrong. And that should be a warning for us because we don't live in, a, in an extremely godly country. Jeremiah talks about this in chapter 18, verse 7. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I have planned to bring on it. Or at another moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to build up or to plant it. If it does evil in my sight by not obeying my voice, then I will think better of the good which I had promised to bless it. So now then, speak to the men of Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I am fashioning calamity against you and devising a plan against you. Oh, turn back each of you from his evil way and perform your ways and reform your ways and your deeds. But they will say, It's hopeless, for we are going to follow our own plans and each of us will act according to the stubbornness of his evil heart. He was pleading, said, I've said we're going to do bad things to you because of your actions, but you can repent. And uh, if you look at the book of Jonah, that's a picture of a city, of a nation who was willing to repent when God had decreed that evil was coming for it. God is willing to change if we're willing to change our hearts. And we can be that difference in a country and, and we'll talk about that some in the upcoming sermons in regards to what's our, what's our role. How can we be that salt and light? What's, what's our responsibilities? So let's look at the purposes of government. Why did God establish government? 
Jeremiah 5, 28 to 31, has a few things to say about that. They are fat, they are sleek, they also excel in deeds of wickedness. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the orphan, that they may prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the poor. Shall I punish these people, declares the Lord, on a nation such as this? Shall I not avenge myself? An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority, and my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? Judgment. These leaders were lying and selfish, and the people loved it that way. But what are the purposes of government in this, in this passage? What does it say are the, are the things that they should have been doing and they weren't doing? If you want to read it again, it's Jeremiah 5, 28 to 31. How's that? Take care of the fatherless. Plead the cause of the orphan that they may prosper. The government was to protect the rights of the poor, the weak, the innocent. I think by extension, the unborn in our country. I used to to think that we as Christians maybe shouldn't be too worried about whether the laws allowed abortion or not. Because when the law, just because the law says something doesn't change anyone's hearts. But I think what this says is God blesses a country who protects the innocent, who protects the poor, the weak, the helpless. And maybe the government is a little bit less responsible for the things that the Declaration of Independence says we were our inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We don't see that at all. I don't, I don't believe they're really biblical because it makes it very clear that life is to be taken by the government if, if as punishment for murder. Liberty can be taken away if we abuse it and selfishly pursuing happiness, I don't see that anywhere. So let's take a little time to look at the government in Israel. And this is it's interesting to look at because, they're, because their religious life and their civil life are so closely tied together and it's sometimes a little bit difficult to separate. But I think if we, if we try to look at the civil, the civil government and the way God set it up, we can learn what God had in mind and what he wants and, and what he is expecting of nations today. The government of Israel was a theocracy or rule by God. God ruled the country through his people that he spoke to, and it was different, different ways throughout history. That looked a little bit differently throughout Israel's history. Uh, later, it was a monarchy under God. At least it was supposed to be under God. Sometimes it was, and sometimes it wasn't. They had division of power. They had, a, a maybe we would call it in English, a prime minister, an Eved Adonai, like Moses, Joshua, kind of this leader who would hear from God and lead the people. They had priests who were more took care of the religious side, but also were involved in government as well. They had a system of judges with an appeal system, a lot like, the, like, like, like we have here in this country. They had prophets, especially in the days of the kings, who would speak to the kings. And God was very, very much wanted um, the leaders to be men of integrity. If you look at Deuteronomy 16, 18, you shall appoint for yourself judges and officers in all your towns which the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not distort justice. You shall not be partial. You shall not take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and perverts the words of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall pursue that you may live and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. I read two different stories about integrity in government. One is in 1929, and this would have been, uh, and this was in Chicago, where um, Al Capone, 
his mobs kind of ruled in spite of government, a very corrupt government. And a 26-year-old government agent named Elliot Ness formed an elite team of nine incorruptible men who were going to bring down Al Capone's $120 million mob empire. And back then, $120 million was a lot more than it was today, than it is today. And at the time, Ness was making $2,800 a year working for the government. That was his salary. And one day, a young man walked into his office and handed Ness an envelope with $2,000 inside. And he said, if you let go of the mob, stop coming after us. I'll give you this much every week. And he handed it back. He said, I'm not, I'm not taking it. And he called a press conference, and he wanted to, tell, he wanted to make a point. He told everyone, this is what happened, and this isn't going to happen. The headline said, Ness and his men are untouchable. That's integrity. He was making $2,800 a year, and he could have got $2,000 a week in bribes, but he said no. In ancient China, a lot of you have heard of the, the Great Wall of China, and the people in northern China, they wanted to, there were a lot of barbaric tribes to the north, so they wanted to protect their country from invaders. So they spent an incredible amount of energy building the Great Wall of China. It was so high, they knew no one could climb over it. So thick, nothing could break it down. They built it and they settled in to enjoy their security. But during the first hundred years of the wall's existence, China was invaded from the north three times. How do you think they got through the wall? They didn't break it down. They didn't climb over it. But they bribed the gatekeepers. And they walked right through the gates. That's the difference between integrity or the lack of it. God called for integrity. He wanted equity and fairness. Many people compare, historians compare the law of Moses to the code of Hammurabi. It was a famous code of law in Sumeria, kind of to the east of, of where Israel lived. And it, was, it was, uh, was very early and it was incredibly fair and <clears throat> it was a really good system of laws. But it was, didn't hold a candle to God's law, the law of Moses, and its fairness and equity for everyone. God's law didn't have any differences for how rich or poor people were to be treated. <clears throat> God's law required them to treat slaves with respect. Foreigners were protected. Even the priests and the kings had to obey all the laws. There were no exceptions. They even had some <clears throat> specific guidance for kings to help them remain humble and follow God. Women were treated much better than in the cultures around Israel at the time. Although there was little religious freedom, everybody was, was expected to be a part of the nation, obey God's laws, both the, the religious and the civil laws. A lot of the Old Testament law, God's law, is the foundation to a lot of the freedoms that we experience today. There was no right to vote. Meetings usually included just men, but sometimes all the people. And then it went to being a monarchy. Certainly wasn't God's will for them to have a king, at least certainly not when Saul became king. I'm not quite sure. Uh, God did give them David, Solomon. David was a man after God's own heart. <clears throat> and I think that it never was God's heart for them to have a monarchy, but in spite of their desire to do that, God still used it to bless them in many ways. And these, these, these are the standards that God holds governments to today. And I think that the closer governments walk to these, these standards that God set up, the more they're blessed. This doesn't make the government Christian or even godly. It doesn't mean that the individuals running the government are Christian. And the blessing of God on the United States or on any government is, is not a sign that it's a, that it's a Christian nation. So in three weeks, we're going to go on to the next section, and I, and I hope this will, I, I, I'm much more excited about this, but I think we have to have this foundational understanding. The Christian in government in the New Testament, and then the Christian in government today. But in conclusion, I would challenge you, let's pray for our leaders, and let's pray that they would acknowledge God. 
And I think them acknowledging God, acknowledging God's principles, following God's blueprint for how nations are to work will be a blessing. And let's also be of salt and light because as we are a salt and light, we can be a preserving influence and we can make a difference. And, and I want to I get into that some more, but let's, let's do that. Let's pray. Let's be a salt and light and let's let people experience God's love through us.